the night her father died, Patricia Pearson's sister, unable to sleep, found herself being comforted by an unknown presence. She later recounted that the visit and the physical feeling and joy that accompanied it could have only been from her newly deceased father. Spurred by this occurrence, Patricia Pearson set out to explore what this and other mysterious encounters reveal about the human condition. And joining us now with what she found is Patricia Pearson, journalist and author of Opening Heaven's Door, What the Dying May Be Trying to Tell Us About Where They're Going. Hello, it's really Hi. nice to meet you. Thanks for being here. So I just um, talked a little bit about the night that your father uh, passed away and your sister experiencing something extraordinary. Tell me more about that night. Well, I think that the, the, the experience itself was remarkable, even regardless of whether my father had died that night. It was something that she'd never had happened to her before. So there was a palpable sense of um, not only a presence in her bedroom, but also um, a, a, a kind of um, almost indescribable um, sort of spiritual energy, um, which, which she, she couldn't make head or tail of. I mean, it had never happened to her before. Um, and almost like an infusion of this kind of um, um, flow of emotion that was quite dramatically different than how she'd been feeling at the time because she had cancer and was mostly just really terrified. Mm. So this was a really dramatic kind of um, alteration of her consciousness. Um, and that in itself was something that my whole family was fascinated by. And so when she tells you and your family this, what's your reaction at first? Um, well, I actually sort of fell to the floor laughing um, in my parents' house in Ottawa, and it, it, was, it wasn't because I was cynical, it was because what else could the universe throw at me in that particular? <laughs> it was actually the day that my last book came out as well. So my father died <clears throat> the day that I got the first ever New York Times review. So, I mean, it was just a ridiculous kind of conflation of mm. remarkable events for me. It's interesting that you say you, you fell down laughing, not because you were cynical, because a lot of people are cynical when, when they hear these kinds of stories. So, so you then tell, you, you know, you tell your friends and others about what this day was like. And when you tell them about the experience that your sister had, about this comforting presence that she had, what kind of reactions did you get? Well, that, the first thing that was so interesting was the number of people who'd had this experience. So that totally took me off guard. I was confiding in it, to people and they would say, you know, I've never told anyone this, but, and then they would proceed to tell me a story. And it, it went across boundaries. I mean, it, it was sometimes people I'd known for years who'd never brought this up. Um, um, it was, you know, people I would have assumed were skeptical, people who were, you know, highly educated people. I mean, it didn't matter. It, mm. it seemed to be a universal human experience. And then I found out from the data that was about 50% of the population has had 50%? some- 50%? 50% of the bereaved population. Okay. How would you characterize, some would say this is a spiritual experience. How would you characterize people, by which I mean people in Western society's attitudes towards spirituality and supernatural? I think that it's become an illegal experience. So it, it, it's, it's something that um, happens to everybody in every culture and, and you know, transnationally. Um, but for us, it's become something that um, we associate with irrationality, with um, you know, superstition, with wishful thinking, with hallucination. And, and so we've distanced ourselves from our own um, experience of, of these things, even though, you know, what these things are is, remains unclear, mm. but it's clear that they are very vivid and very profound. And you say illegal. Why do you choose that word? Because I think it, there's a sense in which it isn't allowed, that you can't, you're not allowed to be talking about this kind of stuff. Um, that it's, it's, it's like an impropriety, you know? Um, and so words are associated with it to kind of gently push it down, like woo-woo, you woo -woo. know? Woo-woo, yeah. Oh, that's woo-woo stuff. Ah. Oh, don't tell me you're going woo-woo on me. Uh. <laughs> yeah, so, so a synonym for crazy. Yeah, and right. flaky. Right. Yeah. And yet, you said, when you were researching this book, statistically 50% have them, you met many friends and family who had said, yeah, I had one of those too, I've just never talked about it. Is that part of the, the illegality of it all, the, the shame in, in culturally that we have? Yeah, I think so. And, and it's remarkable to me, actually, that, uh, you know, people will say to me, you're writing this book, aren't you worried about your reputation? You know, mm. like, I, I, as if I'm, you know, dressing up in a clown suit or something, mm. rather than saying, okay, 
Here is something as profound and remarkable as the experience of love or envy or anger that happens to all human beings in one way or another, not all, but um, why can't we explore it? The question some people often ask when others you know, offer up an experience like that is like, what evidence do you have? What proof do you have? Mm -hmm. What would you say to that? I would say that um, that's the fundamental problem with the subjective human experience. So what proof do I have that I love my husband? I mean, these experiences are, uh, when they happen to the person they happen to, they're not controversial anymore. Mm. There's, no, there's no need to be evidentiary about it. Um, Give me another example of something that we don't require evidence for that you see as a parallel to, to, oh, to this. Oh, um, anything subjective, right? So, so how, how do I prove to you that um, I'm jealous of something? How do I prove to you that... Someone say your actions. Your actions will prove that you're jealous. Right. Well, in this case, these, some of these experiences actually cause action. So, for instance, um, there's a whole body of research on what are called telepathic impressions, where somebody um, becomes aware that somebody they're close to has either died or is in distress before they find out in other ways. Um, they, they may not necessarily know precisely what they're gleaning, but it's so vivid and concrete to them that they'll change their travel plans immediately. They'll Make, they'll send a telegraph, or not anymore, but they'll make <laughs> an a email. phone call. <laughs> they'll send an email. Um, so they'll have a huge emotional reaction, that kind of thing. So that would be, um, you know, a sort of actionable side of the experience. You know, as the, you know, as we modernize and, and arguably we become more uh, fixated on, uh, you know, proof and evidence and scientific evidence and things like that, has society changed? I mean. Have we previously always required this sort of evidence, or historically have we been like, okay, we sort of accept that this happens to people, and you don't require that proof to prove it to me? Well, an example of that would be field research, right? So let's say in the 19th century, somebody goes to, I don't know, the northern desert of Chile, and they come back and say, guess what? I found this place that you know is the most arid in the world, and everybody else says, really? Describe it to us. They don't say did you bring back, you know, an fMRI image of the aridity of the soil? Mm -hmm. So, do you know what I mean? So, there's, there's been shifting standards of evidence over the last 150 years so that the, the, the witnessing report is no longer held to have any inherent validity. And that plays into this. Oh, absolutely, that plays into it, exactly, yeah. And, and what about the changing attitudes that we've had um, about dying compared, compared to now? Um, I think that the... We're in a weird sort of transitional stage now where, let's say 200 years ago, there would have been a lot of people around the bedside of somebody dying, witnessing some of the things I've described in the book. Then we moved into this medicalization of death where um, families were actually prevented from even being in the ICU room, for instance, when somebody was dying. Now, gradually, we're going into a hospice format. Still very small numbers, though, right? Um, and it's in that context of hospice, of, of well-controlled pain, quiet, listening, hushed environments that suddenly we're beginning to see the kinds of experiences that the dying are having that we used to discuss two and three, four hundred years ago, but that only now again are we beginning to be able to see. Mm. To attach to that, I'm guessing that you think that's a good thing, that the hospice experience in terms of connecting with our loved ones that are dying, who are dying, oh, is yeah. just a good experience. Very good experience, yeah. yeah. How do the dying, I know you've talked to a lot of people and do this book and done a lot of research, how uh, typically do the dying tend to communicate their last words? Well, one of the things that I found really fascinating is that they actually shift into a kind of um, a language of journey. So they don't, it's, you know, if they're, if they're dying slowly of a terminal illness, um, they, they gradually become more and more stark in what they say, right? So in the last few days of my sister's life, you know, you could really just get a couple of sentences out of her at a time. There wasn't an on, a back and forth conversation. So at one point, you know, she looked kind of confused and vexed as she was looking out the French doors of her hospice room. And I said, what are you looking at, Catherine? And she sort of laying, you know, held up her hand kind of languidly and said, hapless flight attendants. And you couldn't then say, what do you mean by that? You know, because mm. that was it. That was as far as she was able to talk at that point. And so, but in this context, they start to talk about journey. So they say they want their, their passport or they look for their shoes or they want to be taken home, even if they're dying at home, or um, they want the, um, the boat to come, 
that kind of thing. So it's it's a it's a really interesting uh, so language. Somewhere. They they're think going on a they seem to think they're going somewhere. somewhere. Yeah, which is also comforting for the people who surround them. Well, it's very comforting if you listen to it for what it is instead of you know um, for many families it would be confusing. You'd think they were being you know it was just febrile talk. Mm. You know they're just muttering. Um, but the hospice staff will say, no, listen, what, what they're telling you that they're going to go in the next 72 hours. You also write in your, in your book about visions um, people have uh, during near-death experiences or moments of, of great crisis, the third man or, or grief hallucinations. Mm -hmm. How common are these? Uh, it depends because of the, the way that they're, they're measured depends on the context. So like if you talk about a near-death experience, then that'll be about roughly 17% of the American population anyway, over the course of time, not per, like in a given year. Mm -hmm. um, and then, but now they're discovering these other kinds of experiences where people aren't necessarily anywhere close to death, but are perhaps falling off a mountain or in a plane crash where they're not physically injured, but they have similar kind of um, mystical experiences of kind of perceiving themselves to go out of their body and to be in an ocean of light and that kind of thing. So, so the prevalence is a little bit confusing at this point, I'd say. In doing the research for this book, I'm curious um, about, is it a, let me put it this way, does it cross all kinds of people in, in terms of demographic, having these kinds of experience, or is it particularly prominent in, in, a, in a certain religious community or a certain economically, economic community? No, there's no, there's no correlation at all. It, it just crosses every line. Every line, rich, poor, black, white, child, Christian, adult, secular. disabled. Huh. And, and, and how, uh, how do people who have these experiences, I talked to, but just said, you know, it would be comforting for, the, for your loved ones around you. But ha, is it sort of universal in your research that people who are having this experience, that it is a, a good experience? I mean, are there people that say, I had this experience, it terrified me? Um, there are cases where it, it depends on what happens, but like, for instance, there's a, a sort of category of sensed presence experience that people have called night paralysis. That would be the sort of um, modern psychological term for it. Um, but it's got a long history um, where somebody's half asleep and they experience a presence coming into their bedroom and kind of trying to attack them or even sexually assault them. And it has a quality of horror about it that is almost indescribable to them. It's just mm. literally terrifying. <clears throat> so those unlucky people exist. <laughs> and there's also been, you know, experiences of a quite hellish near-death experience too. So, you know, there's a. It's not a. It's not a Disney landscape, right? Mm. It's. A, it's. You know, as every spiritual tradition would say, you know, the soul goes through valleys and shadows and dark places and. You know, unfortunately, we have to contend with that reality. We can't just announce, yay, guess what? You know, it's all so excitingly beautiful because it's complex. Mm. I, I want to push back for, for a little bit mm -hmm. because as you, as you establish that this is sort of seen as illegal culturally, um, how do you know, Patricia, that people aren't, who have these experiences, aren't just, I don't know, suffering from some sort of mental illness or, or seeing what they want to see because they so dearly want to see it? Because there's no neuroscientific evidence that you can willfully conjure a visual hallucination. There simply isn't the evidence there in neuroscience. We don't even know why, for instance, schizophrenics have auditory hallucinations. We can, we can map the neural correlates of those hallucinations. You can distinguish between imagination and hallucination with fMRI imaging, for instance. Different parts of the brain light up, but there's no explanatory framework for why somebody would have an experience where somebody died and let's say four years later, as people will talk to me, um, they'll feel them in the bed beside them, mm. you know? And also there's no correlation between the emotional state and the when what of these kinds of experiences. Well, if, if, if the premise of a grief hallucination is that you are in such emotional distress in your longing for the missed person, that that would generate the hallucination. Then it would follow that you would have that hallucination when you were in the most distressed place. Okay. But that's not what happens. Sometimes people have it before they know the person's died. Sometimes they have it four years later when they aren't, you know, just irrelevantly in terms of timing. Um, there's no, the, it's like a, 
a sort of loosely seductive explanation, but when you bore down into it, it doesn't, there's no there there. So there may be ultimately a neuroscientific explanation, but we don't have that yet. Okay, let me ask you another one where I want to push back. Uh, almost all of us have seen a movie or a TV show where, where a character dies and then encounters a, you know, a, a person from their past. To what extent could this be explained by uh, you know, popular culture, sort of group think, fueling the kinds of experiences people are having? Well, again, I think that probably the most difficult area to explain with regard to that is the prevalence of people having this experience before they know somebody is in distress or has mm. died. So how, you know, that, that there's no, it doesn't make sense in terms of group think or cultural cues or anything why you would, um, for instance, I was talking to a woman who um, both of her sons drowned in a river and at the time she happened to be shopping in a store and she was just overcome, completely overwhelmed with terror and horror and abandoned her shopping and drove home as fast as she could. How does that relate to cultural mm. cues? Her son's died. Mm -hmm. You talked a little bit about the neuroscience provides uh, you know, no, no evidence in ter terms uh, of offering up an explanation one, to, to say this doesn't happen. What is going on inside our brains? Is there any evidence of what is happening when these visions occur? Um, no, nobody knows for sure. There's some theories about what might be going on. I mean, there's theories on both sides, right? Mm. So there's speculations on both okay, sides, throw right? throw some theories. So one theory would be that it's somehow um, working in relation to uh, a kind of... Um, quantum universe where we're all on, in, in, our consciousness is interconnected. Uh, that it's a collective. Yeah, collective consciousness. And that it's always connected, sort of like the way you, you have water in a pond um, and all the molecules are continuously connected, but it's only when something um, sufficiently distressing or disastrous happens that we sort of tune in to that collective consciousness. So, you know, a pebble drops in the pond and then the ripples go everywhere, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, the idea there would just be that um, you're suddenly becoming aware of something that you always have access to, but that you're not no normally just um, honoring your awareness of. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. You're drawing on it when, when you sort of yeah. need it. Uh, yeah. Okay, give me another theory. <sighs> the other, another theory, of course, would be that it's somehow um, a... Um, connection back and forth between um, the spiritual world and, and this world so that, you know, your, your loved one is reaching to you mm. from another realm. I, I, I don't have, uh, I'm, I'm agnostic on that point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know whether you could say that my father went to my sister per se or whether she just picked up on, on sure. something. Sure. What makes it different? Because I think a lot of people would draw the parallel um, with a dream or, or another kind of... Uh, psychological state. What distinguishes these experiences from dreams? Um, well, when you talk to people who've had, well, for instance, sometimes people have these experiences in the context of dreams. And, you know, I sort of probed around that with them when I was interviewing them. What, why was this more than a dream mm -hmm. to you? And there was a, there was a, a, a quality of um, reality to that dream that was different. So a difference in terms of the amount of detail that they perceived, in terms of the narrative coherence of it, in terms of, um, you know, they, they would be shown something in the dream and then two years later they would see it. Um, and, and so it, it's, it's, I mean, they, there, are, there are all kinds of consciousness overlays here, right? So you can dream music, you can hallucinate music, you can imagine music, you can hear music. So it's really difficult to mm. kind of probe around in the differences, but they're there. Is there a genetic basis for this sort of sixth sense? I have a feeling that there is. I noticed that there were interesting correlations between the sort of um, folk conversation around things like second sight and um, where it was most pronounced in different cultures. So Norway and, and the Scottish Highlands have a lot of this going on in their um, sort of stories and conversations and the terminology is more common there. Um, and then you see this, the genetic similarity between the Norwegians and the Highlanders because of the Vikings. So that, 
was sort of interesting, and I, I noticed that th these things do run in families. Like you'll come across clusters of stories in families. So now that could get to your point about social cues. Mm -hmm. You know, it could be that the that family has a yeah, right? Yeah, and so they're more openly, you know, discuss it, and then maybe they encourage one another to confabulate, or maybe not, or so that could be. But I, I once we get past the point of having to even um, justify justify yeah. it. Then there's so much interesting research that could be done mm -hmm. on those questions. Well, the, and, and that's really my next question, which is, um, are, are, how interested are scientists? I mean, we talked about neuroscience. I mean, are, are they interested in this phenomenon, or is it just like, that's uh, I don't know, wacky, and we can't prove that's the traditional means, and we just don't touch that? They're increasingly interested, I would say. So, for instance, Northwestern University is just beginning to um, figure out how to endow a chair in neuroscience and spirituality. Um, <clears throat> Eben Alexander, the neuro neurosurgeon that had the near-death experience mm -hmm. that was a bestseller, he is now being invited to talk to um, surgical societies, to medical associations and groups. So, I f and I think the reason for that is because on the ground physicians in particular witness these things in their practice. And so they, they, they want increasingly to talk about it. Cardiologists in particular will come across it. And do they also crave, and does society crave, you know, a, a, an explanation in scientific terms rather than experiential explanations? Do oh. we need that to, under, to really accept this and culturally accept this and understand it and make sense as much as we can of this? I think so, yeah. I think it has to be mediated by science because that's the, the dominant paradigm that we accept right now. Maybe we can't do it through science, though, right? Um, I think that you can do it through social science, mm. for sure, right? I mean, you, everything in psychiatry, de depression, you, you can't prove, right? Um, all, th those are all category distinctions that have been made on a subjective basis, and yet we accept it as scientific. Of course, every culture deals with dying and death in its own unique way. Put, put the Western cultural experience in this. I mean, how do other cultures and religions interpret these kinds of visions? Well, that's interesting because some of them actually just sort of take them as is, like very literally. So um, the Jain culture in India or um, certain um, elements of Japanese culture or parts of Indonesia, they will, they will believe, okay, you know, this, 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 um, here's the sensed presence of my husband. Hi, husband, I'm going to set up an altar in my living room and I'm going to serve you your favorite crackers. Mm. Or, you know, they, they've integrated that awareness of a sense, presence, experience into their cultural practice. And I suppose it depends on also what ties into this is a culture, an individual's uh, belief or thoughts about, about an afterlife and what happens to mm -hmm. the dead, not just the dying. No, that's absolutely right. So there are certain churches, for instance, that want nothing to do with this, absolutely nothing to do with it. And people who have near-death experiences, really profound ones, wind up as often being rejected by their church congregation what kind of as churches? by, say, the scientists. We're really dogmatic about this not being okay. Because you're not supposed to, um, well, first of all, with the near-death experience, the, what they experience in is um, a sense of uh, not a very specific doctrine. It's, mm -hmm. not, it's not, you know, the world is not governed by Jesus Christ or by Buddha or whatever, right? It's, it's they experience instead a, a kind of um, union mystica, sort of um, a union of, of all conscious, united consciousness, mm -hmm. right? So the church doesn't want to hear about that. Sure. That doesn't conform. Okay. Uh, before we end our conversation, I want to ask you, uh, I don't know, about the, the elephant in the room, if I can put it that way, which is, you know, w what we've been discussing suggests that there is a ha higher power, a God or whatever you want to call it. And the, the book is called Opening Heaven's Door. Yeah, that's not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, well, let me put you on the spot. I know it's not your title. Your, your publisher probably said that's, that's the yeah. title, but... Where do you stand on, on that idea? I mean, is this, um, you mean, you, the, you words heaven, I mean, this all has to be sort of seen within the, our belief system or religious or spirituality. Where do you stand on that? I'm what would be called a mysterian. A what? A mysterian. A mysterian, what yes. does that mean? Within consciousness studies, that's a category of uh, a place you can be, which is basically just respect the mystery. We haven't figured this out yet. There's things going on that we don't understand. And interesting that you say that because your book helps us to at least try to understand what, what, what may be happening or to accept some of the feelings we're, we're having. Yeah, or just be able to talk about it. Mm. That's all. Well, thank you. You know, it's interesting when we chose to do this book, it, it, we, I thought a lot about it. I thought, 
you know, we all die. We all know people who die. We all have to, to, to grieve in those experiences. And yet we talk so little yeah. about that experience. So thank you for writing this book and for coming thank in you. today. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.